Good morning again to all of you. And I just want to thank our bell choir. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful and uplifting anthem this morning. Thank you for sharing your gifts with us in that way. Would you please pray with me? Oh, Holy One, we thank you for your active and felt presence here in our midst this morning. We pray that you would inspire us and touch us and stretch us through your word for us this day. And oh dear God, may the words that I have to offer here this morning please you and honor you and glorify your holy, holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It is so good to see all of you again this morning. I missed you last Sunday. And at the same time, I had a very special visit with my mom and my brothers last week back in eastern Pennsylvania. My mom, who is now 87 years old, by the way, is doing very well and is as joyful as ever. And she is getting very good care where she lives. I have told many of you that my mom has Alzheimer's. And I plan to share with you more about that journey that our family is on as time goes on. But this morning, I want to turn our focus to our gospel reading from Matthew, which has inspired me to share some very recent worship experiences that I had last weekend while I was away. Now, admittedly, I am somewhat of a church nerd. And that is, <laughs> I am really curious about other churches and faith traditions, and so I do love worshiping in other contexts whenever I have the opportunity. However, doing so often stretches me and pushes me beyond my comfort zone, just like it did last weekend. A week ago, as you will recall, we celebrated All Saints Sunday. And my brother, George, invited me to worship with him on Saturday late afternoon at his church, which is an historic Episcopal cathedral in his community. Now, it had been many years since I've worshiped in an Episcopal church and I was a bit out of practice, so to speak. It was indeed a very moving mass, and the rector's message, his All Saints message, deeply resonated with me. But it wasn't written in the bulletin, and it wasn't always clear to me when to sit, or when to stand, or when to kneel, or when to come forward toward the altar rail, the communion rail, to receive the Eucharist. And so my brother George just kept nudging me along <laughs> and showing me the way. During the prayer time, the rector swung the thurible. You know what a thurible is, that incense holder? And the scent was especially strong and even overpowering for me who was sitting in the very first row. <laughs> and yet, and yet, the rising smoke was a symbolic way of lifting up the names of the saints of our lives, which we were also invited to speak aloud. It was so touching. Worshiping with George and his church was deeply meaningful and a comfort to me in many ways. And at the same time, 
I certainly had my moments of discomfort as a newcomer in worship that day as well. The next morning, last Sunday morning, one of my other brothers, John, invited me to worship with him and my sister-in-law in an elementary school gym where their newly forming Pentecostal church is currently meeting. It is a congregation that serves the growing Spanish-speaking community in the area. And for most of the worship, we were up on our feet and clapping our hands along to the music of the praise band. The congregation was rather small, and they still extended a very extravagant, gracious welcome to me. And the pastor, who is bilingual, was especially accommodating and inclusive. And she even translated her sermon just for John and me as she preached, paragraph by paragraph. We were the only two present who didn't speak Spanish fluently. As discomforting as it was not to understand much of what else was being spoken or prayed or sung in worship that day, being there and worshiping with John and Mary and their congregation was indeed a gift. And despite my feelings of discomfort, I truly felt the love of Christ and warm embrace of such a gracious and welcoming congregation. Throughout the generations, it has been said that Jesus' parables were told to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Maybe you've heard those words before. Jesus' teachings comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Think about that. Our gospel reading from Matthew this morning, this parable that Jesus told about ten young women and the bridegroom, is certainly discomforting and maybe even disturbing. Now, it is important to note that this parable that discomforts is placed toward the end of the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 25. You may recall that there are 28 chapters in Matthew. And so this parable, which is part of what is referred to as the eschatological discourse, also known as the discourse on the last things, comes from the last section of Matthew, where we find Jesus' teaching on grace as well as judgment and the end times. And so here... In this parable, which is about end times, we learn that five of the ten young women were well prepared when the bridegroom came, and then they, in turn, were invited into the banquet. However, the other five women were not prepared. In fact, they had fallen asleep, and they hadn't bought oil for their lamps, and therefore, They were not invited into the banquet at that time. And what was the bridegroom's response to them? It was stern. And he said, keep awake. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Keep awake. Keep awake. Yes, this parable about the ten women and the bridegroom certainly grabs our attention. And yes, it is 
comforting and disturbing and even disruptive to all of the assumptions that we hold about what following Jesus looks like and what faithful living means. Through this story, Jesus discourages his followers then and all of us today from becoming too comfortable or presumptuous or habitual when it comes to our spiritual practices and our personal walks of faith. Living out our faith is not about believing correct thoughts and ideas and teachings. Living out our faith is not through our own efforts or our own good deeds. Rather, faith is about trusting Jesus, which, in response, inspires us to live in a new way, a different way, in the way that Jesus models for us, not the status quo or business as usual kind of living, but rather living in the way of Jesus and in anticipation of God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Living in the way of Jesus also compels us to affirm the equality and dignity of all people and trusting in God, even when it seems as though God is absent or that God is far away or that the bridegroom has been delayed as this parable teaches us. Yes, it is through our faith in God that we do find comfort. And yes, it is often through the discomforting moments and our most challenging and painful experiences that we also experience significant spiritual and personal growth through the grace of God which then often leads us to discover the true meaning and purpose of our lives. I'd like to close this morning with a Franciscan blessing that is often referred to as the discomfort prayer. Receive these words of blessing. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice and oppression and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice and freedom and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain and rejection and hunger and war, so that you may reach out to hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done, to bring justice and kindness to all our children and to the poor. Thanks be to God. Amen.